All right, so my name's Steven Chin. I'm the Java Community Manager um, for Oracle. So I work for the Oracle Technology Network now. Uh, last time I came here, I was in the evangelism team. So new job, but um, you know, similar stuff. I manage the Java Twitter handle, the Facebook page, the community platform site, the virtual technology summits we run, which are free to join, and um, the rest of the the Java community, which you can see here. So 314 Java user groups. Anyone a Jug member here? <laughs> yes, everyone should have raised their hand. Almost everyone did. I guess everyone else is busy eating still. Nine million Java developers. Any Java developers here? Oh, yes. OK, we have, we have Java developers here. Um, Java champions. Do we have any Java champions in the room? OK, well, actually, I can't raise my hand because I made the, the life mistake of joining Oracle, so now I'm an alumnus. <laughs> no longer a Java champion. Um, and there's about 50 plus Java, J Java user groups that are contributing to the JCP. So the J JCP is the Java community process. Um, so that's a, another wonderful organization. A JCP member right here. Yes. Yeah, see, I didn't ask that one. <laughs> okay, but I think this is much harder doing um, Nintendo emulation. So we're gonna we're gonna chat a lot about, a lot about this today. Um, does anyone have or grow up with an NES system in the house? Nintendo. At least one of you guys must have had like a some. What what, vi what video games did you guys have growing up? Super Nintendo. Super Nintendo okay. Yeah, yeah. The successor. Anyone else have a different gaming system at home? Ah, oh, okay. Your kids game? Atari. Yeah, that predates the the NES. Um well, so the of the histor history of like 8-bit gaming and early gaming, the Nintendo was one of the more successful consoles. Um worldwide it sold 61 million units including Japan where it was called the Super Famicom, the US where it was the NES, and in the US and Europe it looks like this with the little gray consoles. Um, and it kind of revived the video game industry after a big slump. Um, so the video game industry was declining, and then Nintendo kind of reinvigorated the market. And Nintendo and Sega were the main players for a while. Um, there are 826 different ROMs to test, so there's quite quite a lot of you know different games with little hacks and things which the console was never originally designed to do, but they found clever ways to do. Um, there's three different processors. There's a a main processor, which was made by Rico, but it was actually a Motorola 68000 derivative chip. Um, and it had 3,510 transistors, which doesn't seem like a lot. But um, they also had a pixel processing unit for graphics, and they had an audio processing unit, or APU, for sound. And they would play tricks with writing to different registers on these three chips in order to do weird timing effects in the games to get like um, split screen scrolling and flashing and all sorts of things. The the gaming hardware was never actually intended to do. So if you want really, really accurate simulation, you need to do 92 million synchronization points per frame to actually get precise emulation of these chips and their weird timings. Um, so you know this is all this is all hard stuff. And I think the hardest part of this is um, testing. <laughs> so you have to play lots of video games to test out your system. So this was um, Ninja Gaiden, top five hardest game ever. Um, so if you if you really want to hate yourself, pop Ninja Gaiden and you'll you'll spend weeks trying to beat it, and you'll waste lots of electricity because every time you reboot, you lose all your progress and start from the beginning. Um, Mega Man, some of you must have know Mega Man. Okay, so the later Mega Mans were easy. Mega Man One was very hard, and it was hard because it was horribly imbalanced. So even things like jumping and moving and like the things that were supposed to be easy and the screen would flicker like crazy whenever there was a boss on the screen, so you couldn't even see where you were as you were fighting. It was quite bad. Um, and then shooters. This is actually a Super NES shooter. Anyone know this one? What? Alt. R type. R type. Yeah, yeah. I think th yeah, I think this is R type. Um, so this is a Konami shooter, and then you get these you get these different power ups and weapons. Um, 
And once you once you actually get really good at games, then you discover um, gaming nirvana. Anyone know what this is? All right, you look like you know. What is this? Yeah, yeah this is the Konami code. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna challenge you since you seem like you know something about video games. <laughs> um, and you get you get this little guy here. So this is our um, our test device. So this is your um, this is your little personal gaming console. It's a 3D printed Raspberry Pi gaming console, and we're gonna we're gonna play the first stage of Super Mario Brothers. So you get to use that, and I'll use the computer here. Apologize to the cameraman who just just pointed at him, I guess. Uh, and of course, I get to use a real computer to do this. I'm going to use NetBeans. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a speed run through the first stage and see who wins. <laughs> um, so if you've already started, just fall in a pit and and die. Just just you can't go back. It doesn't it doesn't go back. You have to fall fall in a pit or something, hit an enemy, and you can restart the stage. All right. So tell me when you're ready. Are you at the beginning? Um, not yet. Uh, let's just, let's just, let's just, 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 oh. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay. So somebody count down to zero. Oh, you're halfway through. Okay, okay. Let me reset it for you. <laughs> hold on, hold on. So there's a, there's a secret to the console if you press select and start at the same time. Yeah, like that, and then hit reset. Yeah, there you're good. All right, so ready, set, go. go. Okay, let's see. You got I'm, I'm going to kill all the enemies just to be fair. See how great I am at this already. Ah, oh, got the mushroom. Does any Does anyone know about the little little secret right here? Get your one up. And of course, you get cool power ups like this. <laughs> and one more power up. Oh wait, this wasn't the right block. Okay, there there was a star somewhere. I think I missed it. How, how are you? How are you doing? Game over. Sorry. Game over. <laughs> <laughs> well, you still have a chance. But, okay. All right, so give him a round of applause for playing. All right, so um, for as a um, condolence prize for, um, for being a good sport, we're going to give you, oh, let me, let me get out of this. We're going to give you something. How about, uh, you want a Raspberry Pi? Oh, okay. How about <laughs> choice? Raspberry Pi. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so that's a Raspberry Pi too, and we're going to talk a little bit about the electronics <laughs> that are running inside of this. Um. Yeah, you can never have enough Raspberry Pis. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is this is what the little console looks like that you are you're playing with. Um, you can pass it around the room as well if other folks want to try. How's it doing? That looks that looks incredibly unhappy. Doop. Reset. <laughs> okay. So um, pass it around the room and you know try playing the game um, and pass it to the next person so everyone gets a little bit of time with the gaming system. And we're going to chat about the electronics. So what I just gave him was one of these guys, uh, Raspberry Pi 2. Does anyone know the latest Raspberry Pi model? Yeah, yeah, it's the 3, which no, you can't buy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's the two latest models you can't actually buy, the 3 and the 0, because they're, um, they have production issues catching up, because it's so popular. 
Um, but the two is readily available. Um, this is the last model, and it's it's quite good. It has a quad core processor, 900 megahertz. Um, you charge it over micro USB. It has Ethernet and USB. It uses a micro SD as the hard drive, um, and then GPIO pins. And this is really what sets it apart from a computer, other than the fact it uses ARM instead of an Intel chip, and then it has GPIO. It's basically a mini computer. Oh, that was that was fast. Maybe I should have challenged you for that. <laughs> um, so who's who's a Raspberry Pi guru? Who kn who knows what these are for? Very good. Um, well, camera's right, so give him a prize for that. And then somebody gets a, a guess at the other one because it's not JTAG. I think JTAG's up here somewhere. There's there's pins, but they're not soldered for JTAG. Uh, yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, prize for him too. Um, so one's camera, one's display. The camera is really great, so you can use like this little pinhole camera. I was thinking of adding to the next version of this a little rear-facing camera. Um, and the other one is a display interface, and the Raspberry Pi Foundation sells a seven-inch display, which is um, slightly too big for putting inside of a handheld console like this. I think the daughter board for the display is about the size that the display I'm using inside of this. So to use a smaller display in the Raspberry Pi, you have to hook it up over a different interface, which might be one of these. Composite. So this is like your, um, like the tube TVs they used to use, used composites. Actually, the original Nintendo was composite as well, but when you do composite to LCD, it looks horrible. So don't do it. And it's also, it sucks a lot of power because you have to power the composite display and you have to power your adapter board, which converts from composite back to, um, back to LCD signal. HDMI is another option. Um, so I would recommend if you're doing your own projects at home or testing stuff out, HDMI is really easy and high quality. But for small projects like this, the power usage is an issue. And you need a daughter board to convert from HDMI back to an LCD signal. Um, SPI is a popular one. This was actually the preferred way to do small um, devices like this previously. But the problem with SPI is it's really not meant for graphics data. So it's too slow and you only get about 10 to 15 frames per second. Um, and the original NES ran at, anyone know? How many frames per second do you think the NES ran at? Okay, well, <laughs> you, it, okay, so, so that's the right answer, but you said 50, so you're right too, so they both get a prize. <laughs> Even guessing wrong doesn't count against the right answer. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it in Europe it was 50 frames per second because of PAL. In the U.S. it was 60 frames per second. It was interlaced, so it was actually every other line. It wasn't quite the full frame. But you get the idea. So if you only do 10 frames per second, it's not quite good enough. So the last option here is device tree support. And the nice thing about the device tree support is it's a direct LCD interface, so you get like high quality and it's fast and there's no extra power needed to back convert. Um, so you can use a little daughter board like this from Adafruit. This makes the wiring easier because it wires the GPIO pins to the LCD pins for you. Um, you could do it directly as well. You just have a mess, a rat's nest of wiring. Um, and then you have to modify, um, add a device tree file to your boot record on the Raspberry Pi to tell it to remap the GPIO pins for display pins instead. Um, and when you're done with this, you only have six GPIO pins left over that you can use for your application. The rest of them are used for the LCD screen. And you don't have I squared C. Does anyone know what I squared C is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a bus for cooking up electronics devices, yeah. Um, UART, anyone know what UART is? Serial? What? Yeah, RS-232, yeah, yeah, prize. Uh, who, who, who said I, <laughs> SPI pins? So SPI, actually we talked about SPI. That's the, um, the serial, high speed, high speed serial. 
by by directional serial, and then you end up with only six GPIO pins left over. So that that's okay if you don't need them. So to implement a controller, how many pins do we need? How many buttons are there on a controller? Okay, who said that? Oh, oh prize. Yes. So. One, two, three, four, and then the D-pad, which is a directional thing, has four different directions. So now we're up to eight, and we only have six GPIO pins, so this is very unfortunate. So if you, um, if you played the original Mario, this was actually the first time my daughter played the original Mario was on the RetroPie, because I gave her this as her, her game to test with. And when she saw this message, she was, she was very disappointed. Because in modern video games, when you beat a little level, a minor level, there's supposed to be like fireworks and dancing and prizes. They award you prizes. Not not this sort of like harsh, like, you know, you just beat a whole stage, like a whole world. And there's like, nope, wrong castle, try again. <laughs> so she was she was extremely disappointed. But I think this is the cool thing about retro games is that they they were they were harsh and difficult, but when you actually beat them, it was it was a reward in itself just to beat the game. Um, and it's a good thing that was a reward because the endings weren't that good either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so anyway, this is how I felt when I was trying to get my, um, my pins working, and I came up with a hardware solution for this, which was to hack it with some diodes. So I hooked up the start button to the left and the right directional arrows. Um, put a couple diodes on this, and that way when you push start, it will press both left and right, and when you push select, it pushes up and down. And this works most of the time. So, does, so can anyone guess a situation where this doesn't work? Press what? Yeah, so you'd have to take the controller apart to do that. But um, and also in games, if you do that, it's kind of interesting because it wasn't a valid operation. So like in Mario, if you press left and right, he moonwalks backwards. <laughs> but anyone else have a different valid input issue? Ah, oh, very good. Prize for that guy. Okay, so there's there's one game that. Um, my my friend Andrew Hoffman, who did the emulation software, which we'll talk about in a sec, um, pointed out is um, Mike Tyson's punch out for the smash moves requires use the directional arrow and smash select or start at the same time or something. Um, and you can't do that on here because when you try to press um, left and start, it just thinks it's start because the start button presses left and right at the same time, right? So you can't actually do that in this particular button setup. So I broke one game, unfortunately. Um, but I'm, I'm fine with that. It was a lot better than trying to, um, to figure out another solution, like something complicated, like a keyboard matrix or something even more complex. OK, so this is the wiring um, on the breadboard. Uh, one, of the, one of the guys at one of the user groups pointed out that this is not the electrically correct way to wire things. Um, the reason I did it like this with the multiple connections to each of the pads here was so we could later take it off the breadboard and wire direct um, line to line on all of the imp all the devices here. So there's exactly one connection from the Kippa to one component. Um, this is the button layout, um, wiring multiple things to the same pad. This is this is hard to do. I would recommend, if you were trying this yourself, to use um, twisted pair wire rather than solid core wire. It's much easier. I learned this the hard way. But it's possible. I did it. Uh, also, highly recommended to use shrink wrap around these two. I did actually, if, if, we, if we opened it up, you'd see that I, from the other end, after I took this picture, I slipped shrink wrap on, or shrink wrap on um, heat shrink wrap. Yes, very good, very good observation. This is what it looks like when software people try to do harder. Does, it, does anyone know the correct way to design a um, system like this if you're trying to wire all this stuff together? What, what would be the, the industrial correct way to do this? 
Come on, there's like a bag of prizes. We have to accelerate them disappearing. Okay, but imagine you have a breadboard. Because you wouldn't actually put a breadboard in a real device, right? That's a prototyping thing. Yes, prize. So, the, the right way of doing this would be to design a PCB, a printed circuit board. Um, and then you could use the printed circuit board to do all the wiring and just have each component go through the right holes and then have an, all the nice tracing on the circuit board. Um, the reason I didn't do that for this project is because I wanted to make it possible for people to do it at home with just electronic hardware and a 3D printer, either your own or one you could borrow. We'll talk about 3D printing in a sec. Um, the problem with doing circuit design is it requires you to send the circuit layout to somebody else to be printed because doing circuit etching, like the, the etching to do the circuit traces, is a lot of hazardous chemicals and not something you really want to play with at home. So I figured it would be better not to have something extra to buy, even though the correct technical solution would be to do a PCB. So this is what the um, completed hardware looks like. And then you can actually play games on it like this, you know, using a little breadboard like a keyboard, and then you can play Mario. Once you have the software written. So the software for this is 100% Java. It's running um, Java SE embedded on the ARM, on the Raspberry Pi. Um, it has a JIT compiler. It uses this Java library, which is written by Andrew Hoffman, called Half NES. Um, it's a really cool project. This runs on the desktop wonderfully. That's what I was running there. It also runs on the Raspberry Pi. You can set up a remote platform for debugging on the Raspberry Pi using NetBeans. Anyone here use NetBeans? <laughs> okay, we, we noticed the user group leader influence. <laughs> um, so NetBeans has really cool remote debugging support. You can easily set it up to connect to a remote device. It automatically deploys the jar, runs the file, lets you hook up the profiler. So it's, it's really good at this stuff. Um, then you just set the run settings to run your, your main class, optionally add arguments and VM options if you need them. And then you're, and then you're up and running with um, Mario on your, on your you know, nice little breadboard hardware. So how many frames per second do you think you get running the um, stock half NES implementation? What? Ten. Close, close, close. Keep going. Come on. This is like, all right, all right, all right, all right. Ah, uh, uh, oh, six. Very good. Prize. <laughs> you have to. You have to keep guessing if you want to get prizes. Okay. Yeah. So you get you have six frames per second running it, um, out of the box. The, well, yeah, it's not too good. Um, so. The, the code base wasn't really tuned for small embedded applications, um, and there were lots of room for optimization. So I hooked up the NetBeans profiler, did a lot of timings, and um, looked at the, um, the JIT logs to see what was happening with inlining, and looked at the GC logs to see when it was garbage collecting. Um, and these were some of the, the things which I um, looked at as possible performance bottlenecks and experimented with. Um, of this list, which, well, I'll, I'll go through them, but which, which do you guys think are the real bottlenecks? So one, one thing I changed was I changed the swing video, which um, goes through X windows, to use JavaFX instead. So what do you guys think? Would that be a bit faster? Would JavaFX be faster or slower than swing? What? Oh uh, yeah, okay. So it it was yeah, it was much faster, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, and of course, of course, I would say that because I'm the JavaFX guy. <laughs> but actually, I I did try to optimize the Swing implementation, and I made it faster than it was stock, because um, the the way it was blitting to screen was quite inefficient. He was doing some buffer copies, which were unnecessary. So I got rid of all the extra buffers and buffer copying. And the second problem with the swing implementation was it 
um, if the color space of your um, buffer and the color space of the screen did not match precisely, there was a, a back end like buffer rearrangement which happened. So um, I made sure that the, the Pi color space settings exactly matched the default swing color space settings which I was using for the buffer. So that was also optimized. So that, that graphics wise, just doing that alone got, gave quite a lot of performance, but you, you still have an issue with swing where it goes through X windows um, for the rendering. And JavaFX bypasses this and goes directly to the graphics frame buffer and it can do 3D acceleration. So it's, it's even like twice as fast as the optimized swing code. Um, synchronization between CPU, PPU, and APU. So the code base he had was doing things per pixel and I modified it to do it per line. So do you think that would help? Yeah, yeah, it, it did. <laughs> Actually, I, 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 I just reverted to an older version of his code where he used to do things per line. Um, per pixel is more accurate, but much, much slower. And I wasn't able to tune it to get the performance I wanted, so I ended up just reverting. Uh, there were a bunch of bitwise helper functions I removed with regular expressions and converted back to normal bit masks for things like setting and clearing and um, clearing individual bits in longs or other numbers. So do you think that was helpful? Hmm. No, yes, no. Okay, so this, this actually was the biggest performance improvement of all. <laughs> um, and the problem is it, it, it wasn't able to properly inline the functions because he would pass in a long and a position to set the bit. Um, and it's not able to automatically convert that back into a, um, a bit mask with the correct bit set in a, in a constant. And it's, it's fairly trivial to just do use a regular expression and replace everything with um, bit masks. But um, actually, uh, the compiler can't really help you here. So, um, you know, for some things, you just need to optimize it by hand. Um, I also extracted PPU operations out, which were happening per pixel or per line to happen once per frame. So that helped a little bit. I replaced some of the APU double math with longs which surprisingly doesn't help on desktop, but helps a lot in the Raspberry Pi because the floating point unit in the Raspberry Pi is not that good. Uh, how about this one? Do you think this helped doing array access with the unsafe libraries? Does, it, does everyone know what unsafe is? Okay, Sven knows, Sebastian knows. For everyone else, the, don't, don't ever use unsafe. <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, VAR handles the new unsafe. Um, so unsafe has a bunch of low-level stuff which are used within the JVM so that the JVM team uses it themselves to do things outside of the memory model, to do things which are not really get you out of protections. So if you're a sandbox app, you can't use any of this. But um, if you're running as root, you can obviously use all this stuff. And one of the things you can try to do is you can try to avoid array index bounds checks using unsafe to do direct memory access of arrays. And it turns out, I tested this quite a bit, it's not actually any faster. So the, the JVM, the JIT compiler is doing its job and, and actually optimizing out that stuff for you. Um, and in general, don't use unsafe because it's going to go away eventually. Um, I also tried to replace loops with system array copy and this also is not that useful because of intrinsics which do it for you. And the last one was pulse with modulation audio. So one of the issues on the Raspberry Pi, which doesn't happen on the desktop, is the audio buffer flushes are very slow. Um, so on the Raspberry Pi, when you try to do audio f buffer flushes, you actually lose time every time you sync audio back because it, it actually uses pulse width modulation for the audio controller, um, which is fairly slow as well. So flushing audio less frequently um, in this case, it was like every three or four frames speeds up things quite a bit because you're only paying the buffer penalty once every four frames. But there is a small problem with that. Is it unhappy? Uh, it might be out of battery as well. Oh, yeah, there you go. 
Oh wait, why not? No, no, let's try. Looks quite unhappy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, hold on. Let me um. Let me power it off. So if you need to power this off, don't use a switch in the back. Do a clean power off because you don't want to corrupt the SD card. Um, and now we can turn it off and turn it back on. And hopefully it'll be happy. Give it about a minute to boot up. Uh, yeah, so the problem with the pulse width modulation audio is that um, sound effects are delayed very slightly. It's hard to notice when it's like, you know, you're, you're skipping like two frames on average or maybe three frames and then it's 60 frames per second. So it's like a fraction of a second things are delayed. But if you're really, if you're really into preciseness, that's, qu that's a little bit off. Okay. Last thing is about the, um, the physical hardware, making one of these. Uh, so how many of you guys have 3D printers at home? Come on. Okay, no one yet. You, you eventually, eventually you'll be sucked into the 3D printing craze. Um, but there may be either a university or a maker zone nearby where you can borrow a 3D printer. Um, and they've gotten quite affordable, you know, for somewhere in the range of $1,000, you can get a 3D printer. Um, you can get better ones. This I think this is like a two thousand five hundred dollar one, the Ultimaker Two. They have an Ultimaker Two Plus as well now, which is the, you know just the newer version of the same thing. Um, the technology is still not quite you know press and print. There's a lot of futzing around with the um, the plastic and the extrusion and getting it to give you good results. But when you do get good results, you can print quite nice prototypes. And it speeds up the design process a lot for doing things you want to build that are physical models. Um, standard 3D printers will print either PLA or ABS as the plastic material in these spools. They'll push it through some sort of tube, melt it at the hot end, and then um, squeeze it out like a, like a tube of toothpaste. And as it comes out, it will melt or it will cool, and then it will harden into um, a solid object. Um, for the modeling, I used um, Autodesk Fusion 360. So this is similar to SolidWorks. SolidWorks is the kind of the industry standard for doing 3D designs, but it's a multi-thousand dollar product. Um, the nice thing about Fusion 360 is they offer a free startup license. So if you're not making any money on what you build, you're just doing it as a hobby project and evenings and weekends. Um, you can use the software and then you can give back when you when you make it big and you start your next Kickstarter project and make billions. Um, but for the rest of us who are just playing around with our 3D printers, um, it's a really good tool to use. They also have a free student license as well. Um, I think Autodesk is quite good with giving out free licenses to students who want to try their software. And it makes the design process a lot easier. So you can specify precise dimensions using you know calipers or direct calculations to figure out the exact width of components. Um, lay things out into different layers. So I have multiple different objects which are kind of fit together like a little little puzzle. Kind of everything snaps in. Um, and then you can print these out as individual parts. Uh, one of the design challenges was getting hinges to work well in plastic. Um, so if you, if you notice the, the hinge on the case, it stays open and, you know, has a little bit of tension and then it closes nicely. Um, but getting a good working hinge was quite difficult. And these are all my, all my failures, my failed attempts at building a hinge. Um, so a little bit frustrating. But eventually I came up with a hinge design that works well in plastic. So my initial attempts were... We're mostly trying to do a polyhedron shape with like, you know, 20 or 20, 24 sides or some, some arbitrary number of sharp edges. And then it would click as you opened or closed it and lock at various positions. The problem is after you opened and closed it about 50 times, it was a perfectly smooth circle. <laughs> and the hinge is now not that useful. 
Um, what I ended up doing instead was to to use um, two triangles that had um, were s that had c were cocentric and slightly different sizes. So you can see here, there's a very small gap, and it it creates an oblong triangle shape, kind of like this, where it's only really happy at 100 degree um, rotations. And in between it, it overlaps. So here you can see the interference when it's 60 degrees off of um, off of a full rotation. Um, so you get 28.254 cubic millimeters of overlap. Now, in reality, it doesn't it doesn't actually overlap. You can't overlap physical materials, but it stretches. So the the, the plastic stretches a little bit to make room for the hinge. And um, Unlike a sharp edge, a smooth edge like this, a very round, smooth edge, um, it, the plastic will bend and it will return back to the original shape. So this hinge has been opened, I don't know, thousands of times, and it still kind of holds its position. Um, so, so demonstration of the hinge, Martin. Clo close the hinge and open it and show how it kind of stays shut and it's unhappy in the middle. Unhappy, and there it's, it's happy. So it kind of gives you an idea of the the way the hinge works. the The design was actually um, partially based on me hanging out with my daughter and playing her DS. Who who said that? You said your kids have a DS, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the DS screens go home and play with it when you get home. But you'll notice that the DS screens they stay closed. They kind of snap closed, and they stay open at about you know 120 degrees. And sometimes they have a second locking point. Occasionally, they have two hinge locking points, but some of them only have one. It depends on the model. Um, so when I was playing with her DS after a bunch of failed polyhedron hinges, I decided to look for designs which only had two positions, two orientations they could open at. And that's how I ended up with this sort of design. Um, and if you took apart the DS at home, you would also discover they use a metal hinge instead. Um, so if you're going to industrially design this, of course, you would use a metal hinge, not a plastic hinge, because making things out of plastic like this is a stupid idea. <laughs> but I wanted to build an entire case which was all plastic, so it'd be easier to reproduce. Um, so other people could try it without ordering random parts from China to finish the product. So there's, there's no screws, there's no hinges, there's nothing required to assemble the case, um, just plastic. Yeah, well, the electronics. <laughs> so you do you do need to put the electronics in the case for it to be useful, but um, yeah. Yeah, whenever I go to Thingiverse and I like Thingiverse is a r repository for different 3D models, and when I get a model which has like a page long bill of materials for different, like you need this length number special screw metric screw, and you need this special nut and this special like. Um, long screw and all these different parts, then it's frustrating because you just want to print the model and try it. And then to actually get all the parts which they want you to assemble something can be like weeks of searching and ordering. Um, so I think this is a lot easier to build. This is what it looks like in Cura, which is the slicing software. So after you finish your 3D models, you take it in Cura. And then you um, this print gives you instructions to the printer. This is also open source software, which is made by the Ultimaker guys, but works with a variety of other 3D printers. Um, this is printing the bottom layer on my 3D printer at home. Um, the top layer, along with some of the um, hinge pieces. This is everything which is required. An anybody know how many pieces are required in total? <laughs> oh, prize. <laughs> 11, yes, that's correct. Okay, well, we, we're not going to give out a Raspberry Pi, but we are going to give out a book. So you'll get a chance at a book. <laughs> um, yeah, so 11 pieces in total, and they kind of snap together, like I said. These, these two guys, does anyone remember those from an earlier picture for what they do? What do you think these two are for, the funky-shaped ones on the right? Yeah, prize for him. Yeah, it's the it's the button holders. 
Um, and the reason I printed those separately is I wanted to make it so you could print this without supports. So if you ever have a, like a hole or a cavity in your model, then the, if the plastic has nothing below it, it will ooze and you get this big like messy nest of stuff. So you always want to make sure it's flat on the build plate and you're just building up from something else which is below it. So by having these printed separately, you can put parts in and then put these on top of it and then have everything nice and compact and fit in place. Um, here are some buttons with the, um, the pins flayed out so they can fit in the case easier. Um, this is very hard to do. I recommend getting some helping hands to, to hold parts while you're soldering and to make sure you don't get a, a cold solder joint. Anyone know what a cold solder joint is? Yeah, so it's a, it's a unreliable. That's actually, all right, give him another prize. It's, it's really the uh, reliability of the connection because you can actually make a, a working electrical connection without wires touching. It will, some current will go through the solder. Um, but if you don't get both pieces of metal hot enough when you're soldering, um, the solder will appear to stick but the piece of metal which is not at the right temperature, the solder won't flow onto, and therefore when you um, stress the connection, it'll, it'll separate from that piece of metal. It's, it's most commonly seen on circuit boards where if you don't, if you don't get a proper connection between the soldering tip and the, um, and the circuit um, plate, the plate on the circuit board, then it comes loose later from rattling or from wear and tear, and you'll see the wire separate the solder sticks to the wire, but not to the circuit board. Um, so be careful when doing this that you actually get both metal wires hot, so it works well. Here's an example of a nice D-pad with everything wired. Uh, Raspberry Pi inside the case here. Um, here is a battery inside the case. Um, one of my daughter's requirements was that the um, RetroPi had to last a long car ride. So originally I wanted to use a smaller battery, but I put a nice big one in, so it lasts. Anyone want to guess how long car how long a long car ride is? About. Okay, we we take longer trips. <laughs> so who said six? Who said six? Okay, six. Yeah, it's actually six and a half hours. It will last. Um, so it lasts. It lasts quite long. Um, and this little board here in the back is really cute. So if you notice in the back, there's a bunch of lights. Um, those are all LEDs on this board, and it also has a micro USB charge board in the side. Um, it charges the battery. It lets the battery charge the or run the power of the Raspberry Pi. It will also run the Raspberry Pi off of the micro USB by itself. It gives low battery indicator lights, charging lights. It has all this wonderful stuff on it. It's actually um, it's also made by Adafruit. It's called the Power Boost, but it has a a chip from a Samsung cell phone, essentially. So it's a, it's basically a cell phone charge circuit on a board that you can hook up to the Raspberry Pi. And it's the best answer to how do I power my Raspberry Pi reliably off of a portable battery. Uh, OK, so here's the Kippa, which we talked about earlier, hooked up to the LCD. And then the first one in, little holder with the um, button here. The um, second holder fits on top of it and holds the rest of the buttons plus the speaker and the um, amplifier board. And this one's tricky to snake through. You have to kind of coil it up with your fingers. The first version of this, the holes were much smaller and I couldn't even do it myself with pliers. So I redesigned it. The side effect, as you notice from the case, is the, the, the panels don't stay closed as well as they should. And when you're, when you're yeah, when your kid forces the, the hinge, that's what happens. That was, that was Cassandra's fault. Um, but it's really my fault, so she's my tester, right? So there's a design flaw here, right? The hinges should stay perfectly shut and flush so it doesn't get caught in the closing mechanism. Um, and then this is the um, extension cable here. So if you happen to break your little twisted wire here, um, you can always replace it later. Does anyone know why you twist the wire like this as you push it through, rather than just going straight? Yeah, 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 exactly. Prize. 
Um, so when you, it, you'll notice this in laptops too. If you open your laptop and they, they have the same sort of coil, you, you coil the wire. So when you open and close it, there's less bending. It produces like less bends in the um, cable during normal use. Um, without this, over time, the cable, the flexing and opening and closing of the cable would eventually um, break the cable because these are very fine wires inside of the cable. Um, if you do break it, you can always replace just this piece because your expensive LCD panel is nicely protected from all this movement. Um, these are the pins which go inside. You also notice there's a little slot here, and that slot matches with another pin which goes down from the top to lock it in place. And when you put the screen in, the locking pins are then locked in place by the screen itself. Uh. <laughs> um, there's two places I had to add supports. So this one here and um, right here. And technically, the model prints without the extra support material, but it prints more reliably. And you just break it off with some pliers at the end. Um, what I found like on this piece is if you printed it without these supports, the outer piece here was too thin and it wouldn't adhere to the build plate and then it would move and then you would end up with like part of the hinge would be missing. Um, and what I found here was the corner would curl up slightly when you printed it. So adding an extra piece of material here keeps the corner from curling up. Um, and then the, the top screen goes in on these rolling hinges on the side. Um, and then you, you have your finished RetroPie gaming system. Um, so just for kicks, who wants, to, who wants to see this guy get disassembled? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, let's do it in the table here. Just for fun. We're, we're, almost, we're almost done with the tour, so I can <laughs> safely <laughs> disassembled my, my only working prototype. <laughs> okay, power. Is it on or off now? I think it's I think it's off. Maybe it's off. Now it's off. Okay. So um the top hinge here. So um, it, it goes two directions, right? So it, it has little snaps here. And then once you get off the snaps, you can slide it up on little rails. Um, if you guys want to come closer, you can too, because it might not be easy to see if you're sitting down. So this guy just slides off. Um, you can see here the um, screen just kind of pops in and out, and that's the screen LCD and the, the locking pin mechanisms here. Um, then we have our curled cable. And the, the bottom opens up similarly. I tried to, in all cases, um, so it wouldn't over time get loose. There's always like locks which go, pins which go both directions to give it force from both directions. So these corners here um, have things which stick in horizontally. And then along the edges here are pins which stick vertically. So to pop it, you have to force the um, the corner hinges a little bit. So you pop the corners out, and then the rest of it just comes out. OK, and now you can see the, the inside of the case. Um, and I'm not going to disassemble it any further, but you can see that these guys kind of pretty pretty tightly fit in. The buttons all have holders, which are just perfectly sized for the buttons, so they also stay in place. Um, oh, and there's one piece here, which is not exactly like the pictures. So we remember we had 11 parts? <coughs> now that it's open, can you guys figure out which of the 11 parts was not 3D printed the same way? No. But you, but that's a good strategy. Guessing, <laughs> guessing is a good strategy. What? Pin, pin, pin. which which pin? Um. But but no, none of the pins. <laughs> okay, so it might it might help. Because you know I I have a, you know I did this, so I have a visual reference of all the parts. But 
one of the parts in the case does not look like the the picture with all the printed parts. Oh, there we go. So here's all the printed parts, and one of the parts does not look the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Who who said it? You said it first. Okay. Prize for him. Um, yeah. So the D-pad, and if you f if you feel the D-pad, you'll notice um, like if you touch the case here, it's it's rough, right? The edges are rough, and if you touch the D-pad, it's very smooth. Um, so I originally printed the D-pad using the Altmaker in the same color, which it looks fine, but it it feels the the the, the D-pad is a little bit rough on the finger. So instead, I tried printing it on a stereolithographic printer. Anybody know what a st what stereolithography is? Yes. What? No, no, that's a different one. Laser centering is cool too. <laughs> okay, so stereolithography is when you have a, a pool of liquid resin and you use ultraviolet light, either from a razor, laser or projector, to then um, take the material and harden it. And the, the advantage of stereolithography is you can get very precise details because you're using a laser and it's very, um, very fine detail. And it's also typically smoother surfaces too because since you're, um, you're hardening resin and you have this pool of resin surrounding it, um, when you pull the part out, it's kind of covered in a slimy thing of resin and you soak it in um, alcohol to, to try to wash off some of the extra resin. But you end up with much smoother, better feeling parts. Um, so you can do this with a normal um, you know, 3D printer like this one, but I think it comes out nicer if you use a um, stereolithography for that particular piece. Of course, you might not have a stereolithographic printer, so, you know. Okay, so in closing, we have a nice, hey, welcome. <laughs> you guys are here for the final video. So we have a, a nice ending. This was the, um, the final, the good ending of Metroid if you actually beat Metroid and got all the items. Um, and if you're playing the game, you'd know that um, Samus, the main character, is actually a, a woman, not a man. But in a spacesuit, of course, you can't tell. So this, this is a good example of um, we, we need more female main characters in our video games and, you know, in programming in general. So my I do a lot of kids' workshops, and we have a really good boy-girl ratio in general. About half the students, or at least a third, are usually girls. Um, and my daughter also helps to to do workshops. So besides just playing video games, she actually helps with the kids' workshops. So that's her again, playing the video game system. You can find the instructions on Thingiverse here. Um, you can also find the instructions in my book oh, here, which has some other cool projects as well. So we're going to give out a copy of the book. Uh, and the way we're going to decide who gets it is you guys have to answer a question that I pick correctly. Um, and we'll make it we'll make it we'll make one a hardware question. How about that? So you guys remember I, I showed the the picture with the um the di the diodes which hooked up the um the start and select buttons to left and right or up and down. So does anybody know the kind of the electrical reason? for why I use diodes in that circuit and not resistors or capacitors or something else. So the electrical means current? Yeah, very good. Okay. Book. <laughs> do you, do you, <laughs> you want to expand on the answer? Yeah, it switches the other direction. It switches the other direction? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It blocks in it. Yes, yes, you're right. Um, yeah, so if it didn't block current, what would happen is when you, um, you know, when you press the when you press left or right, it's also going to trigger the opposite. It's going to trigger everything. Um, the diodes provide current protection, so current flows one way in general. It blocks the other way, um, and that's how you make the the circuit actually work. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the presentation, um, and also. Sebastian's earlier presentation on Jack's RS and our motorcycle videos and the nice um, lunch presentations as well on the new Jeff. 
And um, thank you very much for coming to the Jug Boat and Save meeting. Thanks for having us.